Now, more than half of Ghanaians say the level of corruption in the country has increased and go the government is doing a poor job in fighting it. The new CDD Afrobarometer survey released in the last few hours also shows that approval ratings for the government's anti-corruption efforts have declined sharply since 2017 after more than doubling in the previous three years. According to the research, most Ghanaians perceive at least some corruption in key public institutions, and the majority fear retaliation if they report graft to the authorities. Now, Ghana ranks 78th out of 180 countries on Transparency International 2018 Corruption Perceptions Index, three places below its 2017 position, and that is the Afrobarometer uh, survey released by uh, CDD. It talks about uh, paying bribes to access public services. The police is the institution that the largest uh, number of citizens report bribing access, bribing to access services. Well, Daniel Dagzi has joined me in the studio. He has been going through the Afrobarometer survey and is going to be telling us uh, about it. So what are the key findings in there, especially having to do with the level of corruption and what Ghanaians say about it? So what the CDD did in this Afrobarometer survey, because of course CDD is the organization that carried out the survey here in Ghana, was they asked Ghanaians, has corruption worsened in the past 12 months right. or it has improved? 53% of Ghanaians say corruption in the country has worsened somewhat or a lot during the year preceding the survey. Now, what we found from the CDD is that the survey was carried out between September and October, and the question was in the past 12 months. September and October this 2019. year. 2019. Good. So in the past 12 months, from September 2018 to the same time in 2019, 53% um, say it has worsened. This is a 17 percentage point increase compared to 2017. Now this follows a huge 47 percentage point improvement between 2014 and 2017. All right. Also, they asked that they were doing a bit of comparison with the data and compared with 2017, there's been a 27 percentage point drop in popular approval ratings of government's performance in fighting corruption. So again, yeah, the question was, how do you think government is doing in fighting corruption? Now, there has been a 27 percentage point drop in government's approval um, when it comes to the fight against corruption. Now, if you look at the three years before that, it represents a dramatic reversal of earlier gains. Now, only a minority, that is 40%, say government is doing a fairly or a very good job. Now, it goes on to talk about the, the specific institutions All right. where people have experienced corruption. And I heard you mention just a moment the, ago, the number one is the police. Now, the police in the last few rounds of the Afrobarometer survey has always ranked number one. But in this instance, a perceived corruption among the police has declined slightly, but they are still ranked number one. Number two are judges and So, so and essentially the police are looking slightly better. Yes, but they are still the worst. All right. Yes. And judges and magistrates are number two. And then you come to members of parliament, civil servants and tax officials, they are widely perceived as corrupt. Now, Let, let's, let's scale back a bit and uh, the bit about the parliamentarians. Is it, where did they rank again? They ranked third. So again here, they look at um, how many of the following people do you think are involved in corruption or haven't you heard enough about them to say? Now, most or all of these people are involved in corruption. For members of parliament, it was 36% of the respondents. Some of them involved cor in corruption. For members of parliament, it was 50% um, who answered. So this was, again, against 57% for police being most or all and 32% being some. Yeah, so it was quite an interesting yeah, figure. Yeah, that's, that's significant. Does it say anything about the opposition? Good. Now, the question was, which institutions do you trust? The top three institutions, the army, 72% of them saying that they trust them somewhat or a lot. Religious leaders, 63%. The presidency, so 58%. The army went ahead of the religious leaders. Yes, the army went ahead of the religious leaders. Nine percentage points ahead of religious leaders. And then the presidency was third uh, with 58%. Now, the opposition comes in here 
as the least trusted uh, the um, least yes some of the least trusted institutions 37 percent say opposition's political parties 38 percent say um, local government officials and tax officials are 39 percent any other significant finding in there yeah so it's basically the trend analysis israel of what happens from year to year, and the general observation being made is that the performance of government and the perception of corruption in the country post-2017 at least much to be desired. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel Dante, uh, bringing us those findings uh, of the Afro CDD, Afro Barometer Survey. And uh, moving on uh, to other stories, former President John Mahama has described as untrue a claim by President Kufado that he was in support of a yes vote in the now aborted December 17 referendum. President Kufado, during last Sunday night's address calling off the referendum, stated he consulted his predecessors on the participation of political parties in local government elections. I thought and still think that such reforms should be based on a broad national consensus. It was in furtherance of this and other matters that on Tuesday, 18th April 2017, a little over four months into my mandate, I held a meeting with my three predecessors, the first, second, and fourth presidents of the Fourth Republic, Their Excellencies Jerry John Rawlins, John Ajakum Kufo, and John Dramani Mahama at Jubilee House to seek their views and counsel on these issues. I came away from that meeting with the view that there was consensus amongst us that the time had come for political parties to participate openly in district assembly elections and local government. Though former President Mahama confirms there was consultation on the election of MMDCs, he says there was no definite agreement. In an exclusive interview with Chrissy Parker Welsing, he described President Zakufado's comments as inaccurate. As the president himself said, the consultation was insufficient. I guess that um, we could have managed a better consensus. Um, but some things the president said were inaccurate. Um, he called the former presidents for a consultation. We discussed three things. We discussed welfare matters of ex-presidents, whether um, the parliamentary legislation concerning the retirement of presidents was being implemented. That was the first thing. Then the second thing, we discussed the issue of creation of new regions. And all of us, there was a consensus on the creation of new regions. Then he brought up the issue of the election of MMDCAs. Now there, there was no consensus. Even though there was consultation, there was no consensus. In the former President John Dajikum Kufo, President Rawlings as well. I'll tell you, President Kufo was for political party participation in uh, local government, in the election of DCAs. Mm -hmm. President Kufo Ado was for it. I took the stance of the FIAJO committee that we should still keep political parties out, but we can achieve election of DCAs without political participation. Uh, President Rawlings did not express any solid, any uh, firm stand, you know, but on that particular matter, there was no consensus. Even though we discussed it, there was consultation. Actually, because I had just come out of being president, I was aware of the Constitutional Review and the Constitutional Implementation Committee. And so I gave them a brief on the FIAJO Committee and everything that was discussed there. And the FIAJO Committee recommendation was that the president would uh, nominate five people and the Public Service Commission will shortlist three of them, and three of them will be presented to the electorate to elect who they want as their DC. That was the recommendation that was given. And I felt more inclined towards that. But I must concede that President Akufado and President Kufo at the time were more for political parties uh, participating in the nomination of the DC. So he the country when he said that there was consensus between yourself he said and he came away believing right. Right. that we had achieved consensus mm -hmm. we achieved consensus on some issues to do with welfare on some issues to do with the creation of new regions but on the issue of election of MMDCs, we did not achieve consensus for you as a president perhaps I mean if you were the president would you have withdrawn the referendum looking at the agitation by the opposition party 
I mean, definitely. The president said it. He said, I mean, there was no consensus. Mm -hmm. And normally for an issue such as the amendment of a national constitution, you want to make sure that you carry everybody along. And so if a section of the nation, and a significant section, mm -hmm. and the point is, I think it was unfortunate that he accused the NDC of hypocrisy. That was but the former president, at a meeting with ex the executives of the Federation of Muslim Councils, also accused government of misapplying the Zongo Development Fund. The constituency you represent, which is a Muslim community, if you take the uh, 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 Living Standards Survey, you'll find that a lot of our compatriots in the Muslim community live in the most deprived com communities. We typically call them Zongo areas and, and things like that. But you find out that in those, those are the areas where there are not enough infrastructure, there are not enough utility services, people are overcrowded, the housing is not very good, the roads are poor, are, uh, 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 the access to education is limited and all that. And so these are the things that we want to bubble up. We don't want to come and put up a Zongo Development Fund for show and use it to make football pitches for people to play, teach our women how to cook, watch it and things. No. We think that the issues facing the Muslim community are bigger than that. Access to education, how do we put the children in school and keep them in school so that they don't drop out? Especially the girl children. How do we make sure they go to school so that they realize their fullest potential? Let them at least finish senior high school, by then they'll be 18 years of age, so that they don't get married off after GHS. You know, what is access to health care in the Muslim community? These are the major issues we're addressing as a government. We're not doing a romantic Zongo Development Fund and using the money to attend outdoorings and funerals and uh, sharing rice when it's time for uh, uh, fasting. Uh, sugar, and then when it's time for Eid al you go and give a few bags of rice, and then that is the end of it. And so we want the genuine needs of the people that you represent. And in time and over history, the government that has best represented the interests of the Muslim community in Ghana is the National Democratic Congress. Join News Prime, we're taking a break, but before we do, we've been asking you to share with us your comments on our first story, which has to do with uh, the CDD, Afrobarometer Survey, which says that more than half of Ghanaians say the level of corruption in the country has increased, and the government is doing a poor job at fighting it. Let's uh, read some of your comments. Now, we have uh, Thelma says, we cannot push all the corruption at the doorstep of the politician. What about a civil servant taking money before performing a task he's paid for? Police take money and let wrongdoers walk. What is all that called? Then Sule says, we the downtrodden masses, we hear, we see, and we talk. But who will listen to our cry? Politicians do what they uh, want when they like, and we cannot hold them accountable. As long as the system continues to remain like this, uh, some shall continue to wallow in poverty till, till they die. Inusa says the degree of corruption and the extent to which it is destroying a country which uh, matters. Corruption is destroying Ghana and nobody can contradict this fact. We need to change for the country to progress. Government is claiming general improvements in sanitation across the country, especially in Accra, where more households have now become open defecation free as a result of the sanitation ministry's efforts to supply homes with toilets. Sanitation Minister Cecilia Dapa at a news conference on Tuesday says government intends to do even more in anticipation of the thousands of tourists expected to flock into Ghana for the year of return. Nancy Fajardozi has more in this report. I rank them as soon as I enter your jurisdiction. Without your knowledge, I start ranking. The percentages will be given when the full report is done. Sanitation Minister Cecilia Dapa after she had visited all the metropolitan assemblies in the Greater Crow region to assess the situation there. Nine of the assemblies, she says, were awarded. The ministry, in collaboration with the IRC, implemented the UK aid-funded sanitation challenge for Ghana, aimed at promoting competition amongst the various metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies to design, implement and innovate ideas for the management of their sanitation issues through internal resource mobilization at the local level. Nine MMDAs won various sums of money, and I expected 
to utilize the price amount to improve sanitation. In fact, next week we are doing a, we are having a meeting to assess how far they've gone with that. She justified her claim of a cleaner country despite complaints by some Ghanaians about the Western sanitation situation. My team and I have been touring some parts of the country, learning at first hand the issues on water and sanitation as well as hygiene, the challenges on the ground as well as other related issues that needed our attention. I'm happy to confirm that the sanitation situation across board has generally improved. There is more room to better the situation in line with His Excellency's uh, vision of making Accra the cleanest city in Africa. The one household, one bin, and one business, one bin policies, initiatives within the municipalities will make waste management in the municipalities much easier. Many have questioned the kind of environment that will be welcoming the thousands of tourists expected to visit during the year of return. But the minister explained a six-member committee has been tasked to work on the plan. There is a cabinet committee that has been put in place, comprising, chaired by the Minister for Tourism, Arts and Culture, Sanitation Water Resources member, Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation member, Transport, and then Roads. If I mention transport, you know we have to do engineering, maybe create some one way to make sure there's easy movement of traffic and persons. And health, we work together with environment also on uh, a number of issues. And then transport to make sure uh, systems of transportation um, are well handled. She also announced government was in talks with a foreign company which will be turning plastic waste into diesel. In a related development, uh, Pan-African banking giant Ecobank has announced a major boost to the country's sanitation drive with a $10 million initiative to distribute free waste bins. Dubbed the $1 million bin project, the bank through the MMDAs is giving out the bins to households across the country to help in the management of sanitation. The company, also the bank, also launched an electronic payment system that will enable the households conveniently pay the waste collection companies whilst also tracking the beans. There is more in the following report. The World Bank estimates that poor sanitation and hygiene in Ghana leads to $290 million in economic losses each year. This translates into 1.6 billion cities for much needed development lost annually due to improper waste management or the lack thereof. The one million bin project, the biggest single contribution to the fight against sanitation so far by any corporate organization in Ghana, therefore timely, especially as President Akufado is keen on making Accra the cleanest city in Africa. Chairman of the one million bin project, Lawrence Lai said, the project is also to address indiscriminate littering and promote proper waste collection services for Ghanaians. What we are doing now is that we want to know where every waste bin that we've put into the system is. So we've put what we call radio frequency identification tax on these bins, such that the service providers will know where the bins are, and as and when they are serviced, we'll be able to determine the time and the date the bins were serviced, so that uh, they'll be able to, especially the MMDAs who have uh, contracted the service providers will know how efficient some of these service providers are. Representatives of the waste management companies are expected to move into communities across the country to begin registration and subsequent distribution of the waste bins. Ecobank also stands to gain from the initiative by signing up beneficiaries to a digital platform where they can pay their refuse collection fees. Deputy Minister for Water and Sanitation Resources Michael Jato, who was at the launch, called for the private sector participation in the fight against bad sanitation practices. We want to take this advantage to encourage the private sector and the banks to actually come into this in, uh, area. Because the best way for Ghana to survive is to look at our sanitation. By investing in the sanitation sector, we are solving our health problems and we will do a lot as a country to grow our economy. 
Vice Chairman of the Parliamentary Committee for the Environment, Robert Kwesiamwa, called on citizens to complement government's efforts if sanitation goals are to ever be realized. To rest with the individuals, we need to be educated. We throw the garbage all over the place. Government has done this part. Had it been the government alone, we might have read there. But our people, we are recalcitrant. We are difficult to accept or adopt the right, do the right thing. We want shortcuts. That is our problem. Organizers hope to create over 1,000 direct and indirect jobs through the initiative. PC Nanaya Safos reports. Now, telecom subscribers have in the last few days complained bitterly about the alarming rates at which their data bundles have dissipated on their phones and other devices. Many of them took to social media to express their frustrations with their service providers, spawning a Save Our Data hashtag, which stayed top of the Twitter trends for a while. The phenomenon coincided with an advertised tariff increase by the telcos, prompted by an increase in the communication service tax. Many subscribers have described the increase as too high. It's been quite hectic because as a student, I need data bundles to do my research works and other stuff. And with a 9% increase, it's, it's, it's just been bad because we are not able to get um, the amount of bundle we need to finish our research work. At first, I could spend three CDs or five CD on data bundle daily or weekly. But now I could say I spend 10 CD daily or 20 CD weekly. The last time I purchased bundle, I think it was 10 CDs per gig. But today, just today, I tried to, to purchase another one, 10 CD. I realized that the 10 series they didn't accept it. They said I have to top up some amount before I was able to, to bundle the 10 CDs. And when you, when you equally bundle, the, the, what you use it initially is different from what you are using it now. We wish they could reduce even what we are using initially, we, we are complaining. And now this increment is coming, this is it, making us, it's, it's been terrible for us. So we even wish they could reduce even what we are using. Talk less of increasing it again. It's actually a more burden on us. I think it is not good because um, it happened some years back when we even want to buy a chip. The cost of buying a chip was very expensive, so it got to a time that um, all the telcos or the telcos were like giving us all that they want. And I think um, it is time for Ghanaians to wake up because this is what we are buying and this is what we we practice every day to do our errands, up and downs, our calls, whatever. We go on social media to assess one or two things through this data bundle that we buy. And if they are not doing anything about it, and we are still going to buy it at that cost, I think it's very bad. I see it to be very bad because I'm talking from experience. Now, if you see, I know I, I, I buy 20 Ghana, let's say two days or three days, and now I'm buying 30 Ghana, 40 Ghana, and not getting anything out of it, it is not good. Well, at least one of the telcos heavily criticized by subscribers has reacted. Chief Executive Officer of MTN, Selma Dadivo explains the short changing of subscribers was a result of a decision to stop the upfront deduction of TST and introduce tariff increases. The primary motivation for the changes was to stop the upfront recharge deduction and implement the CST changes through a tariff increase. But in addition to that, we wanted to offer customers a lot more value by introducing non-expiry of bundles and also introducing flexibility for our customers. Um, so we've now introduced a, a menu option where customers can input how much value they want to buy. So for example, if you want to buy a 10 CD bundle, but you only have 9 CD 20 pesos, you can still put in the 9 CD 20 pesos and get the MBs equivalent to that. The yeah, other says the challenge is being resolved and the subscribers should expect refunds. First of all, we're, you know, we apologize sincerely on behalf of myself, my team and MTN for the issues that they faced. But we're doing everything we can to ensure that we resolve them. In view of that, we've also agreed that anyone who purchased a data bundle between December 1st and midnight tonight would receive the same value back 
um, would re would we would give back the same value that they purchased. So for example, if you bought 100 megs of data, you would get 100 megs back from us as a way to say we day for you and we're really sorry for the experience you've gone through. The Communications Committee of Parliament has meanwhile summoned the telecoms chamber to appear before it on Wednesday over the public outrage that followed the alarming dissipation of data bundles. Staff of Power Distributor Ghana Grid Company on Tuesday embarked on their planned protest march to pressure government and other players in the power sector to settle huge debt owed the company. The staff, drawn from across the country, dropped off petitions of the Finance Ministry and the Electricity Company of Ghana, ECG, threatening to escalate their protest if there's no movement in 10 days. The workers have always warned failure to settle the indebtedness could have implications for reliable electricity supply in the country. Komlado marched with the agitator staff on Tuesday. <laughs> They had spoken, drawn the attention of the powers that be to the dire situation confronting the power transmitter, Gridco. Uh, customers, we have uh, supplied them the power, they are not paying us. Particularly, Vaco is owing us close to $32 million. ECG is owing us 607 million Ghana cities. And Netco Distribution Company also is owing us 177 million Ghana cities. And this is not helping us to do our accomplishment maintenance perfectly and this we want the Ghanaians to know. Someone asked that why did um, Greco sit for the debt to accumulate in this excess of amounts before you stand yeah. up and take an action? Well that's why we are saying enough is enough. But it appeared all that would do very little to deal with the huge indebtedness which is threatening to collapse Gridco. An amount approximately 1 billion CDs is to be settled by the Electricity Company of Ghana, ECG, Valco and Netco. Well, what this means from what great co-workers tell us is that in no time, Ghana could be plunged into darkness. And as a result, not even the sweltering heat deterred the agitating staff of Gridco from pouring onto the streets. In their hundreds, they marched to the finance ministry where they made very firm demands. Dominic Annan is a chair of the Tema branch of the Senior Staff Association of Gridco. May the staff of Gridco petition you as follows. One, that you immediately release to Gridco the 250 million Ghana cities directed by His Excellency the President since May 2019. Failure to do so means that we should not take the words of the President serious. But this position, as articulated by Sina Staff Association Chair or Power Transmitter, is what is likely to get the country back to the dreaded days of Doomso. We are very professional people, and uh, after presentation of this petition, we are going to give a timeline by 10th of December. We are very professional. Tomorrow we are supposed to declare a sit-down strike. But having petitioned you, we know you are going to work on it assiduously and make sure that you avert the crisis that is looming. Deputy Finance Minister Abena Oseasari's brief response after receiving the petition from the charged workers did not excite them. So I'm receiving this on behalf of the Minister of Finance and I'll address all the concerns. Um, um, I'll pass on all the concerns you have raised to him as well. The crowd continued a mischanting and singing and proceeded to one of their huge debtors, the ECG offices. The workers demanded to hand over the petition to the managing director of the power distributor. We would have expected the deputy MD if the MD is not available. Yes. This shows that they don't attach any importance to our petition. However, we will do the we will present the petition accordingly. But the message remained constant and loud. The staff of Gridco petitioned the MD of ECG as follows: one, that you immediately pay Gridco the 94 million Ghana cities PDS collection on behalf of ECG during the PDS suspension. We advise the ECG to stop the habit 
of non full payment of electricity yeah. transmission bills. Yeah. Since this habit is not healthy for the sustainability of the NITS. Yeah. The workers say they have given both the Finance Ministry and the Electricity Company of Ghana, ECG, up to December 10 to pay up the monies. <laughs> As the local level elections reckon, members of the Ghana Federation of Disability Organizations are calling on the electorate not to look down on their members who have put themselves up for election. According to the chairman of the governing board of the Disability Council, Yao Ufuri Debra, candidates with disabilities should be measured on their merits. He was speaking at an event to mark the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Here's a report by Philip Ankara. The Persons with Disability Act 2006 makes provision for inclusive participation for persons with disability in Ghana's political governance. Nonetheless, political participation of PWDs in Ghana is generally low. There's a gap between policy and implementation because the Act sets no guidelines for political engagement. Yao Ufuri Debra, chairman of the governing board of the Disability Council, was happy some persons with disability have availed themselves to be elected and called on the electorate to give them the necessary support. On the 17th of uh, December, we are going to have uh, this assembly elections. And I'm happy that persons, some persons with disabilities are putting themselves up for elections. That is quite encouraging. Let us use our uh, resources, our clouds, to appeal to the voting public not to look at the disability of those who are contesting, but their potential capability to deliver. I think we should, when we get opportunities to address the public, we should hammer this point very strongly so that we will be able to get some elected uh, this is assembly men and women. Again, I want to also ask the DPOs not to wait until the day of naming appointees to the assembly to go and press for it. This is the opportune time for us to get in touch with the presidency, the chief of staff, to issue a directive to all assemblies to ensure that persons with disability are fairly represented at the general at the district assemblies. If we don't take the opportunity now, if we may miss the opportunity and that will not hunger well for our participation in governance. He also lauded the government for implementing some social intervention policies to alleviate their plight, but called for a more effective method in executing these programs. Well, the challenges, I can say that, um, border on implementation. Um, government has put in place all these um, measures to ensure that we are fully integrated into the system. We um, access some social interventions, but um, those who lead the implementation, um, some of them do not implement it in the way that uh, make persons with, a, with disability feel the impact of the interventionist programs. Well, when it comes to employment, for example, we believe that now the the persons with disability are taking advantage of the educational opportunities right from basic to tertiary uh, institutions. The, a lot of our persons with disability are coming out with the professional uh, qualifications. And for that matter, um, employment of them is what government should make deliberate policy for. We believe that if there is an employment equity policy for persons with disability. It will help 
persons with disability who go through the education system come out successfully to be employed. Because as of now, it depends upon the whims and caprices of employers. Employers who are sensitive to disability, they tend to um, employ. But those who are not, they look at your disability and turn you down. So unless we have a deliberate policy, this problem will continue and it will uh, deny persons with disability their right to employment. Observance of the day aims to promote an understanding of disability issues and mobilize support for the dignity, rights and well-being of persons with disabilities. This year's celebration was on the theme Disability Inclusion in the Sustainable Development Goals, Renewing Commitments and Mobilizing Support from Stakeholders. For John News, Philip Ancres Report. Some players in the creative arts industry are excited about proposed establishment of the first ever creative arts senior high school in Kumasi. President Kufu Adokat soared on Sunday for the project to settle speculation it was going to be cited at the president's hometown, Chevy. I mean, Teria has more in the following report. The proposed boarding school is expected to provide basic skills training to young ones seeking career in creative arts to discover their talents. Industry players say the school would breathe life into an industry which has been bedeviled by a lack of formal training, especially at the pre tertiary levels. Juliet Yasantua Asante is board chair of the National Film and Television Institute, NAFTI. She is full of praise for President Ekufuado for the initiative, but wants government to commit more investments into the industry. And as a sector, we see this as a recognition that opens the door. But we are saying, let's not stop here. We are going to train people to be entrepreneurs. We are going to train people to critically think, to appreciate good things, to come up with solutions. In TCSC, be a creative app. What do we mean? We mean that if you are in your environment and you find a problem, you should find a solution creatively, creatively find your, a solution in your environment. And for us, that is what this means. Today, we have the plan platform to stand on and speak to the president and say we want to say thank you for doing this but don't stop here because if you create a school but you don't look at the at the sector as a whole if you don't invest in the sector as a whole we are not going anywhere and so we are using today to stand on the platform and say to Mr. President that in your next year please unapologetically invest in the creative industry the creative sector for Ghana for music producer Mark Okreo Kumante and actress Emilia Broby, who both witnessed the salt cutting, the gesture has come at the right time. We know how to do the show, we know how to do the business, but most of us lack knowledge in the industry. And it's because some of us left the industry somewhere in the middle of our lives. And so because of that, um, we make mistakes with some of the things we, 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 we must do to make sure we achieve success to the fullest. And then die rich. It's because we lack knowledge, that's why most of us die poor. And so to be able to compete, it's a global village now. We need to add knowledge to the talents. Today's day and age, talent is not enough. And so it is good the president, in his own wisdom, or the Ministry of Education, have decided that they want to garnish whatever we are doing with the school. And so it's a, it's a good start. At least the next generation, the next generation is going to have is going to have education, knowledge, plus the talent, and it will yield a lot of results. From Kumasi for Joy News, Oyemi Tewia reporting.